So, this is what Britain woke up to on June the 7th, 1944, 70 years ago today. Main headline, invaders thrusting inland. Um, what they used to do with papers of this era, the main story would obviously run down the front. But what you find is the stories that are on the front are usually um, carried on on the back of the paper as well. So nowadays a paper would start at the front and it would continue over the page with carrying on the story. But in this instance, the story's on the front and it continues over the back. So, in Great Britain, um, midnight news, landings are successful, naval losses regarded as very light. Main headline, invaders thrusting inland. This is the first look that Britain would have got of the invasion in plan format, showing the area where it landed at. Um, main headline, invaders thrusting inland. Midnight communique from Supreme Allied HQ announced reports of operations so far show that our initial forces succeeded in their initial landings. Fighting continues. Our aircraft met with little, en little enemy fighter opposition or AA gunfire. Naval casualties are regarded as being very light, especially when the magnitude of the operation is taken into account. In Washington, Mr. Henry Stimson, US War Secretary, said the invasion was going very nicely. President Roosevelt said it was running to schedule. Up to noon, US naval losses were two destroyers and a landing vessel. Air losses were about 1%. Allied airmen returning from attacks on North France last evening reported that our troops were moving inland. There was no longer any opposition on the beaches now guarded by balloons. One pilot saw the stars and stripes flying over a French town. According to early reports, British, Canadian and American spearhead troops of the Allied armies have gained footholds along the Normandy coast and in some places have thrust several miles inland. Fighting is going on inside the town of Conn, se seven miles from the coast and several intact bridges have been captured. Battling still further inland and well established is the greatest airborne army ever flown into action. These troops were landed with great accuracy and very little loss. The airborne fleet consisted of a thousand troop carrying planes including gliders, but though several vital obstacles have been overcome with much less loss than expected, the Germans will concentrate their reserves, heavy battles are looming. This was a situation outlined in the Commons last night by Mr Churchill. Continued on the back page. So if you go to the back page, <coughs> we have various addresses for the Daily Mirror, and then you have the handy blackout times in the UK. But the invasion continues. German reports, on which there is no Allied comment whatever, stated last night that an original invasion front of 80 miles between Barfleur and Trouville had been still further widened. The enemy also stated that the Allies had one front a mile wide and 10 to 15 miles deep and that tanks had penetrated inland. Later German broadcasts said that new Allied landings had taken place well east of the Normandy sector at Calais and Boulogne and that a savage battle was raging against powerful Allied paratroop forces which had landed north of Rouen, city on the Seine. A counter-attack in the Cherbourg Peninsula was also claimed. News from General Eisenhower's HQ revealed that the landings were made after colossal air blows by Allied heavy and medium bombers. 10,000 tons of bombs were dropped on the invasion targets from midnight to 8am yesterday and 7,500 sorties were flown. And 6, 600 Allied warships, battleships, cruisers, destroyers and monitors laid down a tremendous bombardment. One US battleship sailed close in shore to pulverise some very troublesome fortifications. The result of this double pounding was that the landing squads found less opposition than was expected from the coastal batteries. A seagoing secret weapon called the PT boat went into action as a screen for the Allied minesweepers, which, in an immensely difficult night operation, sailed in as spearhead craft to sweep mine free channels for the greatest fleet of landing vessels. There has never been a more amazing fleet. It consisted of 4,000 ships with several thousand smaller craft. Around and around it, the Navy's destroyers guarded its crossing. The men in the first landing craft now faced the problems of tackling the underwater mines and other obstacles placed by the enemy to guard the beaches. They were timed to land at low tide when many of the mines would be exposed, and the task was less difficult than had been expected. The invasion had begun with all the hopes of a tortured continent centred on the soldiers opening their struggle for the beachheads. Specially trained shock troops with flamethrowers and explosives moved forward under covering fire to attack the enemy's strong points. 
an RAF breach squadron landed with the first wave. The three main tasks of these highly trained specialists was to supervise in cooperation with the Army the landing and moving forward of RAF personnel vehicles and stores, to give technical advice to the Army on all matters affecting the RAF, and to put a balloon cover over the beaches as a protection against low-flying aircraft. Comrades of these airmen were filling the skies to support the invasion troops. In all, 4,750 4, sorties were flown up to 10pm, and the Luftwaffe withheld its challenge. The Great Air Assault actually started on Monday night when very much over 5,000 tonnes of bombs were dropped on 10 coastal batteries. It was indicated at Supreme HQ Allied Expeditionary Force that there is no grounds for any assumption that the Luftwaffe is beaten. The Germans are estimated to have 1,750 first-line fighters in Germany and the West, a figure which could be maintained for some time even under heavy losses. What they have to decide is whether to thin out the defence of Germany in order to tackle the beachheads and other invasion targets. It is believed they will do these fierce air battles are expected. What about the German land defences? Their outstanding feature is that despite immense elaboration of strong points and defences of, of main ports, they have little depth. The enemy has planned his defences to defeat the attack on the beaches. The situation last night was that four or five of the first hurdles had been surmounted. General Montgomery is in charge of the assault forces. So this is the first photograph of the French coast, taken from an aircraft. French coast is over here. This is a now famous picture. Among the first of the airborne troops landing in France were four lieutenants. And then we go back to the front page again. <coughs> so, I saw them leap to the beach aboard a British destroyer off North France Tuesday. Guns are belching flame from more than 600 Allied warships. Thousands of bombers are roaring overhead and fighters are weaving in and out of the clouds. The invasion of Western Europe has begun. Rolling clouds of dense black and grey smoke cover the beaches southwest of Le Havre, writes Desmond Tai of Reuter. We are standing some 8,000 yards off the beaches of bernier sur mer seven miles east of Aramanche, and from the bridge of this destroyer I can see vast numbers of naval craft. In 10 minutes, more than 2,000 tons of high explosive shells have gone down on the beachhead. It is now exactly 7.20 a.m. and through my glasses I can see the first wave of assault troops touching down on the water's edge and fan up the beach. Under the supreme command of Admiral Sir Bertrand Ramsey, Allied Naval Commander Expeditionary Force, two great forces are taking part. An Eastern Task Force, mostly British and Canadian warships, is led by Rear Admiral Sir Philip Vian of Cossack fame. A Western Task Force, mainly of American warships, is commanded by US Rear Admiral Alan G. Kirk. The weather for the landings was not perfect, but despite high running seas and a strong northwesterly wind, a bold decision was taken to go ahead. The plans allowed for four phases. One, landings by airborne paratroops to the rear. Two, a tremendous night bombardment of the RAF, by the RAF on the landing beaches themselves. Three, a bombardment of more than 600 Allied warships from battleships, cruisers, monitors and destroyers. Four, a daybreak bombing attack by the full force of the US Air Force just after dawn and before the first troops went in. Events moved rapidly after 4 a.m. and I will put on record the diary kept on the bridge. 5.7 a.m. lying 8 miles from the loading position for invasion craft. 5.20 dawn innumerable assault ships appear smudgingly. 5.27 night bombing has ceased and the great naval bombardment begins. 5.33 we're moving slowly. 5.36 cruisers open fire. Continued on back page. We can now recognise the Belfast and the Mauritius. 5.45, the big assault ships start lowering their boats, crowded with tin-hatted soldiers. I can pick out the Prince Henry, Glen Eyre and Queen Emma. 5.46, there are at least 1,000 ships in our sector alone. Naval bombardment intensifies. Big battleships joining. We see the war spite of Salerno fame belching fire. Orion, Mauritius and another cruiser, the Black Prince, are belting away. 5.50, I see the first flash from a German shore battery. So far, not one enemy plane has arrived. It appears we have taken the enemy by surprise. 5.55, a thin line of stout tank landing craft heads towards the shore. Minesweepers are returning. They have got plenty of guts, these fellows. 6 o'clock, the coast is clearly visible. Enemy batteries are firing spasmodically. Big fires are burning ashore. 6.30, the whole of the invasion fleet is now awaiting just 7 miles of coast hills. 6.50, the destroyers now close to the shore, bombarding any target they can see. A string of tank landing craft passes. Soldiers sitting on the turrets of the tanks give the thumbs up sign. 
Weather is worsening. Big clouds are coming up. Spitfires and air cobras roar overhead. 7 o'clock. The first wave of fortresses comes in. One pattern of bombs flattens out the beach section opposite our destroyer. 7.20. It is by now light. I can see the spire of the Bernier Belfry. Buildings are crumpled. 7.25. The first wave of landing craft have reached the shore. Red tracers from close range enemy weapons are searing across the beach. Men leap out of the craft and move forward. Tanks follow them. 7.35, we move out on patrol. The battle goes on. And so it continues all the way through. And the thing about newspapers is, as well as having the, the event that's actually in the history books, they also have little snippets that probably have never hit any history books. So you, if, you, if it hadn't been for newspapers like this, you'd tend to miss the smaller kind of insignificant details like this one. Padre blessed the purple banner. Wives gave up coupons for it. From Ian Fife with an airborne unit. A flag hallowed by player and Bressing of rich purple cloth, illustrious with the figure of Bellafron riding the winged horse Pegasus, first of all airborne warriors, will be carried into battle in one of the most perilous and vital missions of the Great Invasion, that of air pioneers, the men who prepare the way. It is their own flag and their wives have sacrificed coupons for it. The service of dedication was strange, moving the last before the men parachuted down into enemy territory. As you read this, the men of this airborne unit are already in France. For a week I have been living with these men in a sealed camp cut off from the outside world, waiting to go to France with them. Fifteen padres, as well as doctors, jumped or glided with the invasion army. We have a little snippet there. Two girls who told the world. The teleprinter operators who sent off the invasion flash from London announcing the landings to the world were Florence Mills, a 23-year-old London girl who sent the flash to America, and Elsie Page, a 21-year-old Canadian who was responsible for breaking the news to British newspapers. And then we have a, a D-Day advertisement here. British soldier. Will he find you as young and lovely when he comes home again? Eve Toilet Soap. Keeps your complexion radiantly youthful for him. Eight and a half pence, including purchase tax, plus a coupon. This is second week of ration period number 12. You have all the, the usual stuff. The Dutch warned. We salute them, chance for polls, don't be fooled. Invasion, little brief snippets for the British public. General Dwight D. Eisenhower is directing the invasion from a motor trailer in a thick wood near the bases from which the assault fleets launched their attack. Each man of the invading army was issued with one day's emergency rations for the first day's operations. US paratroops darkened their faces with cocoa and carried sheath knives strapped to their ankles, tommy guns strapped to the waist, Bandoliers and hand grenades, coals of rope, pick handles, spades and rubber dinghies. Many fighter pilots never saw a German plane. One fighter pilot who was on patrol for six hours said it was as boring as hell. During the last two years, during the last two years, the British War Office has made more original maps of France than the country itself has made since the days of Julius Caesar. The US forces alone used 125 million maps. Then we have a write up by the newspaper looking towards the future. Then there's a reprint of General Eisenhower's Soldiers, Sailors, Airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, which was a handbill given to the troops. Then we have the now famous Hour of Reckoning Daily Mirror cartoon. Then we have a kind of potted history of the Liberators. We've got Eisenhower, Montgomery, Ramsey, and Tedder. Come over the page. There's various cartoons, not D-Day related. Book Ryan, Beazelbub Jones, Belinda, Popeye, Ruggles, Garth. Then we have through the black and through the blacked out villages of Britain for months past have rumbled columns after columns of armoured vehicles of every description, manned by the fighting men of the United Nations, trained to the key point of efficiency. And so it goes on. And then the assaulting infantry had to be rehearsed and made familiar with the use of many special weapons which have been developed 
a backroom story which cannot yet be told. Royal engineers trained with replicas of every known defensive device used by the enemy and practiced their destruction. For the early phases of the maintenance of the bridgehead, every ship had to be loaded with a mixed cargo, so much food, so much ammunition, so much signals equipment, so many engineered and ordnance stores, and so much water and medical supplies. For wheel transport, the production programs had to be settled and put into hand years before the invading force was finally assembled, and it was the duck, the lorry which can carry men and supplies from ship to shore and convert itself instantly on reaching the beach into a land vehicle that was made vehicle number one for the invasion. Thousands of other vehicles had to be waterproofed, made capable of getting through seawater without breaking down. And you're setting up wire signals and everything like that. The Great Armada stretched over the horizon. Advertisement for the movie For Whom the Bells Toll. And there was one little snippet somewhere, which I spotted. Throughout Britain yesterday, people flocked to special invasion day services a few hours after hearing the news. Many American servicemen and women were among the congregation at Westminster Abbey. A public prayer service for victory was held in St Paul's Cathedral yesterday evening. Hundreds of workers in the London East End district filed quietly from their factory to a nearby church. Their families joined them as they knelt even in the aisles. In a typical farming village in East Anglia, the vicar called from the cottage to cottage and soon the bells of the old church called the congregation of men and land girls from the fields and women from the kitchen still wearing their pinafores. But one man was not at church. The postmaster was franking letters which had been left with him by soldiers who had been billeted in the area. They were letters the men had written home to be posted on D-Day. Go back to the back again. The first assault waves of infantry and sappers are followed by supporting troops. Behind them again come the follow-up forces and the leading convoys of maintenance ships on board which are specially trained Royal Engineers personnel and organised for the working of derricks and ship to shore barge. Here on the beaches swept by enemy fire in an assault against the strongest defence system ever constructed is the test of months and years of planning, training, organisation and rehearsals. You have great armada stretched over the horizon. Everywhere on the sea are steel ships, you can't get away from them. You can't look anywhere without seeing long lines of troop ships, supply vessels, assault craft and warships stretching into the horizon. So that's how 70 years ago today June the 7th, 1944, the Daily Mirror reported goings-on in Normandy.